welcome on Conversations with Green Change Makers in Japan. I'm Helen, the founder of Modana in Transition, and I will be your host on this podcast. The goal of this discussion is to bring along passionate individuals to talk about various topics around ecology and well-being in Japan. This episode is a collaboration between Motaina in Transition, Fab Cafe Tokyo, and Global Goals Jam Tokyo. Today, I'm welcoming Robin Lewis, the co-founder of MyMizu. MyMizu is an award-winning initiative to reduce consumption of single-use plastics. On top of that, he's also the co-founder and director of Social Innovation Japan, a platform for social good focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and he's also a consultant at the World Bank. He has such an amazing career with 10 years experience working with intergovernmental organizations, social enterprises and NGOs, and will tell us more about his story and plastic waste in Japan. I'm now leaving you with our guest. Enjoy the discussion. To get started, can you tell us a bit more about when and how you became aware of the climate change issue and how you started your ecological transition? Sure. Okay. So first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. Um, what you're both doing is super cool. I need to go uh, and check out Fab Cafe sometime. Um, and I'm happy to say that Fab Cafe just registered on the Miami Zoo platform uh, recently. So we're super happy to, to be here. Um, and I want to just also give a shout out. It's great to see some familiar faces. Um, and thank you to Keisuke Stan from Robo Japan. If you can see his Zoom background, it's a My Music bottle. So thank you for, for <laughs> representing. <laughs> um, but to get back to your question, um, how did I first become uh, aware and engaged with um, climate change? I, it's quite a, a, a long story, but just to give you a snapshot, um, I'm half Japanese and also half English. And my mother's family is originally from Miyagi Prefecture, uh, Sendai, in the north of Japan. Um, and when the tsunami happened, I was in the UK in 2011. But I came back because of uh, my family was here. Um, and I started working in uh, humanitarian um, affairs, specifically with disasters. Um, so over the about five or six years, I was working full time um, in disaster response, kind of based in Japan, but working in several different countries that were affected by flooding, hurricanes, typhoons, all of these terrible things. Um, and it very clearly, be it very quickly became clear that this was part of a structural issue, right? The, the fact that there is climate change is making these natural disasters worse. Uh, it was affecting the most um, marginalized people in many countries. So having had that experience of working in many different countries affected by natural disasters, um, it really um, hit home just how serious the situation is. Uh, and that was kind of how I began to transition more towards working with climate change and also climate mitigation as well. Um, so that's kind of a very long story, but that was the initial, um, I guess, backstory behind this. Makes sense. So you started talking a little bit about it, but can you tell us a little bit more about your career story? Because it's quite interesting, uh, <laughs> as it seems like. <laughs> Sure, it's it's kind of a weird story, but um, I, ever since I was young, I think my parents wanted me to become a, a banker or you know someone who's very uh, successful in the corporate world, um, and so I studied business at university. Um, but I always say that studying business made me really despise business, right? So because I learned so much about um, the negative impacts that traditional business has on society. Um, and so while everyone was studying marketing and finance and, and these things, um, I was studying uh, business ethics and also uh, how business integrates with society. Uh, at the time, uh, corporate social responsibility, CSR, was um, one of the big um, focus areas. So that's my, um, that was my initial academic background. But then because of the tsunami, um, I had this big kind of personal uh, crisis where I thought, you know, Uh, do I go and do something kind of interesting and different or do I try and take this corporate path? Um, and I decided to do um, the the more exciting thing and, and start working in this humanitarian uh, world. Um, and then after that, you know, I never plan anything. Everything just somehow uh, happens. Um, but after um, kind of retiring from the, the humanitarian world, Um, I ended up in the in an international organization, which is part of the United Nations, 
um, working on climate change, um, mainly on policy and also on uh, multilateral uh, relations in, in regard to um, climate change. Uh, so it's kind of humanitarian world, then more policy slash research. And then this took me to my Mizu as well. So here's a rough kind of um, roadmap as, as to how I got here. So it feels like it really started with the understanding the impact of the natural disasters. Yeah. And then how did you realize like the problem with the plastic issue? This is a, a, another story that uh, starts back in 2018. So um, I was in Okinawa, a beautiful place called Miyakujima. And uh, oh, it's, it's, like a trap, it's like a tropical paradise. So one day I was um, going for a walk around Miyakojima, mm. beautiful island. Um, and I just kind of stumbled upon this huge uh, pile of, of waste from the ocean. And a lot of it was fishing gear. There was a lot of um, other kinds of plastic bags and things. But one of the main things that I saw was uh, plastic bottles. Um, and at that moment, I thought, this is a kind of a crazy world we live in where In Japan, we have some of the cleanest, safest water in the world. And yet so many of these bottles, many of them water bottles, were ending up on this beach. Um, and so that was the moment where I thought, okay, we have to, uh, we have to do something about this. This background, uh, my, my, my music background here is from uh, Miyakojima in Okinawa, that, where that moment happened. I'm glad you took this kind of problem you saw and put it into action. I think that's really good. Thank you. Well, it, I guess it takes these kinds of experiences to really make you realize um, just how bad the problem is. Until now, I've been working mainly in other countries and everyone told me, oh, Japan is so clean. Japan is so, um, you know, there's no litter. And then seeing all of these, uh, these rubbish um, kind of dumps across various beaches really made me think, okay, well, that's not the case. Um, and what can we do about it? And so there's like this aspect that we see, like the natural environment being degraded by the, the plastic. But can you tell us a bit more about like the overall and the, all the different aspects with the plastic issue? Yeah, this is a really um, complex issue. But I think there are so many aspects, right? One is a systemic aspect. There is a systems uh, that is fundamentally Um, broken right we are producing so much plastic more than ever before and it's growing exponentially every year um, and at the same time we're not really dealing with this plastic so we take crude oil out of the the ground we produce plastic and many other products and ultimately um, we only recycle a small portion of that plastic just to give you one example i have a a pet bottle. I don't know if you can see it. A pet bottle in front of my face here. <laughs> And um, we consume one million of these every single minute around the world, every minute. And we do not recycle about 90%, right? So that means they're ending up in the landfills, they're ending up uh, being combusted, being burnt, or they're ending up in the rivers and the oceans. So this is a huge challenge where we really don't have a solution apart from to reduce, right? There's so much conversation about we're recycling, you know, we're good, we're, we're good because everything gets recycled. But that is actually a, a very um, controversial kind of idea in that we actually to address the problem, we fundamentally need to uh, reduce consumption as opposed to just hoping it gets recycled down the line. And I wonder actually, you know, why is this issue not so talked about in Japan? Why do we have this image of Japan being so clean? Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. I mean, what I would say here, uh, I am half Japanese, half English, um, and I've lived here for, for more than half of my life. Um, and actually, Japan is a very environmentally friendly country. So I'm not going to stay here and say, you know, we need to, you know, yeah, let's, let's bash Japan. In no way, I, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. But, um, you know, and if you look at history, actually, for example, if you look at the Edo period of, of Japanese history, everything was circular. And circular meaning, We minimize the resource usage. We use just what we need. And then the end of life products, we somehow reintegrate or reuse. And it was a very, very eco-friendly um, society. But as we uh, begin to prioritize economic growth, I mean, we see this uh, post-Second World War. Same with many other countries. We see this rapid, rapid economic growth. Um, and as a result, 
we start to use more disposables, we start to uh, increase GDP and all of these things that then lead to a more convenient, but also a more potentially environmentally unfriendly um, way of life. Um, so I would say that, yes, uh, in terms of plastic consumption, the conversation in Japan um, is not maybe as high profile as in, the, in other countries. I, I think that's, that's fairly um, clear. But I would say that there's also a huge opportunity because fundamentally Japan is an extremely environmentally friendly country. We just need to create that new system, that new change, uh, and we can get there. Um, it, with regards to recycling uh, plastic, there is uh, there's a lot of information out there saying that Japan is extremely strong with recycling. So to give you some statistics, the official uh, recycling rate of single-use plastic uh, at the end of its life in Japan is roughly 85%, according to the, uh, the Ministry of Environment. Uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, globally, it's about 20%. So 85%. 20%, right? So on the surface, this is great news, right? We're doing really well. But actually, this is where it's so important to understand uh, the problem and the details. Because uh, if you open up the lid of this 84%, um, the majority of this recycled plastic is uh, burnt, it's combusted. It's a process called thermal recycling, where you're essentially re you're burning this uh, plastic as fuel you uh, and you generate electricity through a turbine right so it's actually very different to what the general consumer thinks of recycling it doesn't get most of it doesn't get turned into some beautiful new product the majority is either burnt or um, exported to other countries including uh, before it was china but now since 2018 that policy has shifted uh, and it's now other countries like malaysia vietnam and so on so i think Maybe the, the biggest challenge here we have is a mismatch of perception where we think, okay, everything's recycled. Let's just keep using. Let's just keep using this plastic. But actually, no, we have to take a step back and reduce because recycling is not the solution. Sorry, and just, just as an FYI, I can talk for like 10 hours about recycling. So please, <laughs> please cut me off if you, if you think I'm going for too long, okay? <laughs> no, I think it's a very interesting topic because uh, recycling is often seen as the solution to the problem, but it's actually not a solution. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I mean, there are some fascinating studies that show the psychological impact of recycling. So there is a, a study where there were two rooms, right? One room had a recycling bin and a non-recycling bin. Another room had just the normal bin, right? And what's really interesting is that the people in the room with the recycling bin used much more plastic because you think, oh, it's okay. It'll get recycled. It's cool. Let's just keep using plastic. Whereas if you think it's going to get burnt or go to the, the landfill, then you think, oh, maybe, you know, uh, I shouldn't use so much. So it's actually potentially harming the situation by having this, this fallacy of, of recycling. So uh, let's get into uh, what you've been doing to address this problem. <laughs> and uh, so sure. it's time for you to tell us a bit more about uh, Maimise, the project you co-founded and what this is all about. Okay, so just to give you a brief overview of what we do, um, what we're aiming for is to create a systemic change, right? So that means we're trying to create a new revolution, a new system uh, in society, not just in Japan, Um, but all over the world as well. And what we do in, in a sentence, in a nutshell, is we help people to shift away from these plastic bottles and to their, use their reusable bottles like this. And we have a an refill ecosystem where people can take their bottles anywhere in Japan or anywhere in the world and get free water um, instead of buying pet bottles, plastic bottles of water. It's a really simple idea. And how we do this is uh, we have three types of um, refill stations. One is a um, public area. So that means a park, water fountain, or a, a station where they have a water fountain. Second one is private um, businesses. So that means we have um, places like Fab Cafe Tokyo now. We also have um, other brands like Hilton Hotel, Patagonia, where you can walk in for free. You don't have to buy anything and you can refill Um, of course, it's appreciated if you do buy something, but it's not required. And thirdly, uh, we have natural uh, spring water, wakimizu. And this is like this is um, spring water that you can find in Hokkaido, in, in actually in Tokyo as well, and in many other parts of Japan. So these are three types of 
um, refill locations that we provide via our free app. It's a free um, iPhone and Android application. Um, and yeah, that's the, that's the general idea. It's super simple. Um, on top of the app, we also do many other things like educational programs and, and so on. Uh, but that's it in a nutshell. So you talked a little bit about like the story that kind of got you this idea about the, the problem with plastic. But, uh, you know, when did you actually start the project and how did the idea kind of evolve and start in the first place? Yeah, I mean, okay, so it took me a while to start. So the, the trip to Okinawa, to this beautiful place behind me, it was in 2018. And I started researching in early 2019. So I actually, I was away for a while for work and, and I kept making excuses. Um, and then in 2019, I finally started doing research and really um, getting into the, the, the details. Um, and the app itself, Um, we have actually probably the world's largest database on drinkable water. And the way this works is that it's a crowdsourced platform. So we, it's not a service that we provide. It's one that we all create together. And so it's a very simple um, technological piece. But we started building the app in about um, May or June of 2019. And we launched it in about September. So we had three, three crazy months of just every day working like crazy um and i was very lucky in that i found a engineer who's a very strong environmentalist and a great guy who said you know i like this idea um let's make this happen and so uh, his name is laurie he's a really just a genius kind of technology guy um and so uh we he well he helped us really to develop the the app and, and made this all possible um so that was how we developed the actual platform Um, but if I if I may, I mean, our bigger mission is to create a movement. So my Mizu does not just equal an app. Um, we also do lots of um, educational stuff. We do partnerships with local governments, partnerships with corporations. And so this whole kind of journey of it's only been nine months since we've launched um, has been just a, a remarkable journey. Um, so that's kind of the backstory. Um, and this might be interesting to people, but... but um, One of the ways that we funded the very beginning of the project was through a crowdfunding campaign. So we used uh, Kickstarter, which is a great campaign. I, I think several people who supported us are here on this call. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, that was how we got the initial uh, push to make this happen. Um, and we've also uh, been doing many other things since then. And I feel like I've... Uh, I've aged about 10 years since uh, since we launched. <laughs> yeah. So is the crowdfunding the only uh, revenue you have or what's your, your business model to be able to keep, you know, this social enterprise uh, going? So this is, this is a question we get all the time. And, and what is really important is we do not monetize the app. We will never make MyMizu a paid service because of a fundamental belief that access to drinking water is a human right. Uh, designated by the United Nations, right? We should never have to buy drinking water, especially in a country where we're surrounded by drinkable water. Uh, this is a classic story of, um, <laughs> without sounding too radical, um, corporate, essentially, uh, corporations making big money, right? If you talk to people 30 or 40 years ago, they said buying water wasn't even a thing, right? This is just something that has been uh, created in, by various marketing channels and so on. Anyway, um, so yeah, the app is free, <laughs> but where we monetize is through, I'd say, three main streams. One is uh, with corporate collaboration. So we've developed new projects, new campaigns with companies um, such as Audi, uh, Audi Japan. Uh, we've also done something with Shizen Denryoku, which is um, one of Japan's leading renewable energies companies. Uh, and also uh, with IKEA recently, we launched a campaign on World Environment Day. And we're also developing, we're about to launch, fingers crossed, if uh, everything works out, a, a big new project with a, a beverage company, actually, which is quite exciting. Um, that's the first stream is corporate collaboration. Second stream is uh, we have our online store, our online store, uh, and also our own products. So we sell Miami Zoo bottles, not just on the online store, but also um, at the cafes and restaurants and shops that are part of the uh, Miami Zoo network. Um, and we also... Um, Thirdly, we work with local government as well. So we've been very fortunate to uh, do a pilot project with Corbeshi, with Corbe City, 
Uh, and we're also currently working on uh, two or three other partnerships with local government. Um, and how that works is we provide value um, by helping cities become more sustainable um, and also helping um, people to stay hydrated, which is so important during summer. On top of that, we also reduce their plastic waste disposal, which is very expensive, right? So these are our key offerings to local governments. Uh, and so those are the three main ones, corporate collaborations, uh, our own My Music products, and then um, local government. There's actually a, a question from uh, the audience about the Japanese um, politics and policies, you know, in place to try to synthesize people to reduce their plastic consumption or even like businesses to kind of limit plastic usage. Do you have any idea of any policies or anything implemented by governments in Japan to uh, make sure that people and uh, companies are using less uh, plastics? Yeah, I mean, one very famous one that's coming up now is the uh, charging of uh, lejibukuro, of these uh, plastic bags that you take from the supermarket and so on. So as you may, have, may well have heard from the 1st of July, you have to pay to uh, use a plastic bag. That's one simple one that's being um, introduced next month, or actually in a few days. Um, on top of that, there's been various um, initiatives at the local level. Um, so, for example, in Kameoka, is a, a city uh, in Kyoto, um, they have also been doing a lot of initiatives around uh, reducing plastic waste. So there are government initiatives out there, but perhaps there should be more. <laughs> so I guess you're more focused on uh, waste, Uh, but some people are wondering, you know, if you're aware of any uh, kind of uh, energy consumption uh, kind of measures being in place. Like, for example, in France, they've started to give money to people to insulate their homes. Like, yeah. is there something like that in Japan? Yeah, you know, um, energy is not necessarily in my field. So perhaps some other people might know more than me. Um, but yeah, I do believe there are several subsidies for solar panel installations uh, and for um, for other kind of energy, uh, eco-friendly energy alternatives. If I can do a very quick um, bit of promotion, uh, if anyone wants to change their house or shop energy to 100% renewables, Maimizu has partnered with Shizen Den Yoku-san, which is Shizen Energy, and we provide um, 100% renewable energy from solar, uh, from wind and from um, biomass, I believe. So there are lots of alternatives out there um, where you can switch to 100% renewable energy. And uh, actually, we did this uh, recently, and our energy bill is basically the same, if not cheaper, than our previous fossil fuel-based electricity as well. So there are many options out there for energy. There's a, a question about if you know when the plastic is burned, mm. what effect does it have on the environment? Okay, that's a great question. And honestly, again, uh, the incineration process is not really my area of expertise. But what I do know is that there's kind of open incineration where you incinerate um, outside of plants. And this is not really the case in Japan. But in Japan, there are several um, rigid guidelines and, and rules yeah, to essentially minimize the, the um, amount of toxic uh, pollutants that enter the atmosphere. Um, but that being said, I think the, the fundamental um, issue is before the incineration is also just how much energy it takes to make the plastic bottle, to get the crude oil from the ground, make this plastic bottle, deliver it to the, you know, to the vending machine, sell it, keep the vending machine running. There's so many CO2 emissions in, um, in these processes. And we've actually done a lot of research into how, how much CO2 is emitted Uh, if you buy a, a bottled water from the vending machine, there's roughly 340 grams of CO2 emission every time you, you buy uh, bottled water from the vending machine. Compared to if you just refill your bottle like this, it's about uh, six grams. So there's a huge difference in terms of CO2 emissions every time you buy a plastic bottle. There's a, another interesting question, which is, does yeah. it make sense to separate all plastic and wash it? <laughs> or is it better in more booming if it burns anyways? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And honestly, it depends very much by the uh, local government. So uh, Shinjuku-ku will have a different um, different policy to Nakano-ku, to Edugao-ku. So it's all very separate. Um, what I would say is it's worth doing it, but it's not guaranteed that it will be recycled. So yeah, I would say, yes, keep doing it. Uh, let's go back a little bit about uh, My Mizu. Uh, what is your sure. vision for uh, My Mizu, let's say, in the, in the future? What do you want to achieve? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So 
I mean, our big mission is to create a, a movement for sustainability, not just about plastic waste, but to really raise this conversation. And what's critical is that we want to make it a fun and uh, kind of positive conversation. Until now, um, the conversation around environment very much has been, um, you know, climate crisis, all this. And it's very true. I'm not going to I'm not going to deny the fact that there is a huge problem going on. Um, but what we believe as Miamizu is that to create systemic change for the 90% of people who don't necessarily care, we have to provide hope and also bring people in uh, through a positive messaging. So um, our approach is very much uh, pull. Let's let's come. Let's do this together. Not push. You know, this is a climate crisis. We've got to do something. Um, so on that note, um, we've been doing a lot of uh, collaborations with uh, governments and companies. Um, we're currently looking beyond just water. Uh, water is a great starting point because everyone needs water to survive, um, but it's also you know, relatively um, limited in its impact. So what we're currently doing is we're developing a new um, project, which is, which is not water related, but very similar in concept. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, we're also looking at um, expanding globally. So we actually have a team in Singapore right now who's expanding the service uh, in Singapore, and we hope to really take this to all countries uh, around the world. Uh, and luckily, since we've launched, we've had many requests from Brazil, uh, from Spain, from uh, South Africa as well to do the same thing uh, in these countries. So, uh, you know, our idea is to really scale this to a whole whole new level. And I think the Olympics next year provides a really big opportunity for us to, to hopefully, you know, gay, engage these people and, and spread it around the world. So those are two things that we have coming up, but there are a few other things too that I can share later on. Um, by the way, don't hesitate to reach out to Robin if you feel like your company and the Miami's you could really collaborate together. So there's a question about like raising awareness in uh, schools. Is it something you're also uh, working on? Yeah, we've been doing, uh, in this past, I think, eight months, we've done uh, over 100 um, workshops, talks and seminars um, at schools, at universities, at companies. Uh, so yeah, we do lots of uh, these things. And that's, again, part of the bigger mission to create a movement uh, for, for change. So yeah, we're, we're always happy to do any uh, educational activities. And so please get in touch if you'd like to do that. Another thing which is quite interesting, is someone is uh, just sharing their idea that when Japanese people are out and about, they're not really drinking uh, much water. So, yeah. you know, how is the other like type of beverage could be addressed, I guess? Mm. Uh, that, that would be the question. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and honestly, if you look at the bottled water market, um, it's growing by about, I think, 5% uh, compound annual growth rate um, every year. And so like bottled water is growing as a market globally, but also in Japan, uh, right? And so um, we do get this question sometimes, but I would say, let's start with the basics, right? Bottled water is, it's a, it's a growing market and it's also kind of unnecessary because we are surrounded by drinkable water. Mm -hmm. uh, but I agree. I mean, there are many ways that we can make uh, an impact in other um, products. And so that's why we're also looking at um, taking that next step away from, from water as well going forward. Makes sense. Um, actually, I had questions about the, the water in Japan. So how do yeah. people perceive tap water in Japan? Like, is it considered like, do people have a view of it being safe to drink and a good water? Or, you know, do they fear maybe radioactive, com you know, emissions or pesticides or whatsoever? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and again, um, Japan, compared to a lot of other countries around the world, has some of the safest and um, arguably tastiest water. Um, just to provide some kind of framing for this, we're working a lot with the waterworks department in Kobe right now, as I mentioned before. And just to give you some context, the tap water um, standards are extremely high. It's actually more strict than bottled water, right? So for tap water, they have roughly, I think, 58 criteria to check it's safe, everything. Radioactivity, um, lead, all of this stuff. For bottled water, it's about, um, I think, 18 maybe on average criteria. So it's much less strict. Uh, so in theory, it should be uh, much more safe. Um, but I think that's part, of the, that's part of our challenge is, again, perception, right? People think, oh, you know, tap water tastes a bit smelly. And cool, that's fine. I mean, if you think that, that's no problem. 
Um, but what I would say is just get a, a filter. You know, there's you can buy a filter off uh, in your local store for you know two three thousand yen, and uh, your problem should be solved. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's a perception issue that we really have to um, to address. What do you feel actually is a real barrier for people to ditch the plastic bottles in Japan? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think it's really about about habits, right? Um, if we look at how habits have changed over the course of time. Uh, you know, the, the smoking rate has gone down significantly in many countries. We're seeing societal shifts against certain uh, behaviors. Um, so I would say um, what needs to really happen for this to become a wide scale uh, movement is we need more engagement from media. I mean, media plays such a huge role in this but also pop culture, right? There are many influencers who are starting to speak out about plastic. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that we need, as well as this government regulation and, and the, the big hand of government, right? So I, I fundamentally think that we need two sides of this story. We need the top-down government incentives and regulation. We also need this bottom-up societal drive to change. Um, but I, the, the most important thing for me and as my Mizu is to make it an appealing and fun um, process where you know we're doing this because we can and we we should not because uh, we have to because of this you know this crisis that's happening so yeah that's that's some of the things that i think may help and uh, do you have any uh, tips actually uh, for us to try to reduce you know our plastic consumption apart from using my bottle is there any other tips you would recommend Yeah, I mean, there's so many um, resources and products out there that can help you shift away from plastic. I mean, just to name a few, there's um, beeswax wrap. I'm, I'm sure some people in this this audience use the beeswax wrap instead of cling film, saran wrap. Um, there's obviously my hashi, like the, your own chopsticks that you can take around. Uh, my bagu is obviously a huge, a huge thing around Japan. So I think there's there's so many ways to do it. Um, it's just making it a habit. And so what I do now is I leave my, my my bagu by the door. So every time I leave, I just remember, like, I can't forget my my bagu and so on. And that, that's uh, an easy shift away, I think. Changing habits. <laughs> Not mm. always easy, but yeah. Mm. But I mean, as my Mizu, what, you know, just to kind of go back to the bigger picture stuff and why we started this was having worked in this this environmental space for a while you know it's so difficult to engage people right we're all so busy we have our lives we have our you know our instagram and all this stuff and honestly when you start talking about co2 emissions and ocean acidification and coral reefs dying people i think switch off and that for me is why um what we're doing with my music is is, is powerful because we you know everyone knows what this plastic bottle is right so if, if we can engage people as a first step just through thinking about plastic bottles. That's the, the beginning of a much broader journey for systems-wide change, which is what we really need. So many people ask me, yeah, you guys are reducing plastic. And I, I say, no, that's our first step. This is how we engage people in the conversation. And then we take it from there and let's, let's make this movement happen. And uh, actually, you know, you were talking earlier about the different ways you're funding uh, your business. Yeah, yeah. And so what's the incentive for uh, commercial uh, uh, entities uh, in kind of offering free tap water? What do they gain in exchange? To register as a, as a shop or cafe or hotel is free for, on my music. Uh, the benefit they get is uh, they get people coming through the door. So it's a very strong uh, PR mechanism, right? And we've, I've heard so many people uh, using my Mizu and going into new cafes, new restaurants. Uh, and so maybe you refill your water bottle and then, and then you buy a donut or you buy a cake or something. Or maybe the next day you come back with your friends and you have a nice time in a cafe. Um, so it's, it's a really simple way of doing uh, public relations. And on top of that, it's a super easy way for any business to uh, engage with plastic consumption and to contribute to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals as well. So those are the two main things. A practical question, actually, from someone. Uh, sure. For the spring type of water points, how can we make sure they, they have uh, potable water, like drinkable water? That's a great question. So a lot of spring water is um, checked by the local government. So I was in uh, Hokkaido recently, and they have these beautiful, beautiful springs where you can uh, just dip your own little ladle and you get fresh water from the spring. Um, and next to a lot of those um, spring water um, locations, they have the government verified um, checks on paper. 
So you know that it's trustworthy. So yeah, that's one way. And also, why did you choose Miami's instead of a more internationally uh, understandable <laughs> concept? <laughs> I think I like the MM, my Mizu. <laughs> my aqua would not sound so so great. But actually, you know, what um, what we're trying to do is like futon, wabi sabi, wasabi, all these these Japanese words are used in other countries. Same with motainai. Motainai is used in, in many other countries as well. Um, so uh, our kind of slightly um, subtle mission is to spread this Mizu word through a soft diplomacy. And, uh, and kind of take over the world with, with free water. Uh, there's a question about uh, Binshotan. Is it still used by Japanese people? So maybe there's one other question, which is uh, someone is struggling to find it in Tokyo. So yeah. if you're looking for that, you can go, for example, to Tokyo Ends. There are some uh, available there. Um, but I don't know, uh, Robin, do you feel people are using these filters? Binchotan are the, the, the charcoal filters, right? Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's actually interesting because abroad you see a lot of people using charcoal, uh, bamboo charcoal filters. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't see many young people using Binchotan. So I don't know, maybe that's a new area of, uh, of opportunity. <laughs> maybe someone here can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Of the next my music product in your store. <laughs> yeah, my 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 binchota. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the same name. But actually, you know, interestingly, um, do you know Furoshiki? Furoshiki is this like yes. traditional um, cloth where you carry things, right? Um, my friend from uh, from New York was saying that recently or before COVID, um, people he would see people carrying uh, their grocery shopping in Furoshiki. And so it's quite a cool, like, it's quite a cool uh, transition, you know, between super old school, traditional Japanese crafts and things being used in the modern day world for uh, sustainability. Yeah. And in France, actually, it's uh, getting popular for wrapping Christmas presents. Oh, great. So it's quite nice to see the influence from, uh, from Japan traditional yeah. culture. One question that I wanted to pop in about for Robin. Um, sure. So you mentioned before about my Mizu kind of riding this like cool wave or not wave in particular, you didn't use that word, but basically like making um, this kind of sustainable uh, behavior like cool. Mm. Um, and I think that that's something that's very new in Japan. And I, I think I see my Mizu as being a kind of um, forerunner for this. Um, you might see this kind of like sustainable fashion or sustainable trendiness happening in the West, but I think it's just now coming here. And I think as a business, you guys have been really successful at, you know, being able to reach a really wide audience by offering something that's practical, cool, sustainable. It marks all of the, the good boxes. And so I think that maybe in this audience today, we might have some um, entrepreneurs as well. And I'm wondering if you have any advice or insights or tips for people who want to start their own sustainable business or people who want to like try to get in on this this way which i hope gets bigger and bigger yeah that's a that's a really great uh question and and honestly um there have been some terrifying moments uh, honestly this journey has been uh really exciting but also there's been many many challenges uh, and luckily if you look today you know we've got four full-time employees we have uh, a, a large team of people now that's that's making this happen but at the beginning it was just you know one or two people in a room in a whiteboard just doing things right so we've come a very long way what i would say is that um i think being authentic is so critical right when you when you're messaging uh, and when you're communicating with uh, an audience or a customer whatever it is i think um your why your your north star as to why you are doing something is just the most important thing and i think the reason why we've had so many people supporting us and, and spreading the the idea and the movement is because they buy into this this idea that we can do better. We, we don't have to live like this. Um, and so I think for me, that's been the main takeaway is just being authentic and having such a clear mission that anyone can, can buy into, um, as well as um, <laughs> oh, so many things. But, um, you know, I would say what I'm really, I'm terrible at many things. Like I have, I'm so bad at detail-oriented um, tasks and things. But what I am maybe good at is essentially telling people that I will do something. And the reason I do that on social media, on you know, in person, is because it pressures you to deliver, right? So 
before I, uh, we launched my Mizu, um, I announced on social media, hey, I'm going to launch my Mizu. Mm-hmm. And this forces you, it, you know, kicks you in the, in the butt to actually make it happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I would say staying accountable is also really critical. And once you take that first step, then everything becomes 10 times uh, more easy. Yeah, actually, I think that's directly connected to the question that, w- that Helen asked about what are the incentives for businesses to join MyMizu? Yeah. Uh, marketing trends are also showing that if companies and brands don't live their mission or live their vision or live their, you know, what they're saying that they do, their statement um, mm-hmm. through the practices that they have in their shop or, or company, then consumers won't come. Right. Um, they're going to choose the, the brand or the market that is living their, the truth or the visions that they have. And so I think that any um, cafe or restaurant who has my Mizu, that's one step that they can take to do that, um, which is so simple and easy. Like I signed up for my Mizu with Fab Cafe. It was less than 10 minutes. I mean, maybe even less than five minutes. I mean, literally just taking information from Google Maps and plugging it into the app. So anybody who's listening, who's interested to join my Mizu from that perspective, it's very user-friendly and you should do it. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks. No, thank you so much. So we actually uh, getting close to the end of the chat. I just wanted to very quickly to ask you one last question, which is, you know, what resources you could share with the audience and recommend on ecology or plastic waste issue to you know, get more information or inspiration? Okay, so uh, my first recommendation would be, um, I know Kelsey and Fab Cafe Tokyo are doing many of these um, hackathons, idea-thons around um, SDGs. So I would say take part in that. I'd also say, Helen, I know you, you know a lot of things about um, this space. So I'd say talk to Helen. <laughs> Those are my first two resources. Um, I would also uh, recommend, I mean, there are so many books and documentaries and so on. Um, but one, I guess, a couple of, of books or documentaries that really made a, an impact on me were there's one called the the corporation this was one that like completely just rocked my world i was still in in uh, i was in business school in in the uk um and the corporation it, it just makes you rethink the fundamental um relationship between business and society so that's one two is uh, there's a documentary called um cowspiracy c-o-w S-P-I-R-A-C-Y, Cowspiracy. And that's also really, that was kind of a wake-up call as to how uh, our individual actions are affecting society on an environmental uh, level. Um, And there's so many books. I mean, there's one uh, recently published by Naomi Klein, who's a famous author, called uh, This Changes Everything. It's a really interesting perspective on climate change. Uh, And lastly, I'm listening to one now uh, called... Uh, the donut economy that's the donut economy and um that's a super interesting perspective on how we can live better uh, not just um economically but also in a more environmentally friendly way as a society oh can i say one more sorry my yes. favorite podcast right now uh, I, I just love this podcast it's called um outrage outrage and optimism and it's uh, hosted by uh, Cristina Figueres, who is, uh, she is the, um, the creator, the power woman behind the 2015 Paris Agreement, which is such a critical um, piece of this, this environmental conversation. So uh, Outrage and Optimism podcast is, is really fantastic. Awesome. Lots of good resources. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> no problem. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time today to uh, tell us, you know, your story and sharing more about uh, my music. Thank you for listening. You will find all the notes from the discussion on Motainai Transition website, motainai-transition.com. If you like the podcast, don't hesitate to leave a rating on your favorite podcast app. Matane!